welcome. Today we're chatting with David Spinks. Hey everyone. <laughs> yes, uh, I look forward to it as well. Hey, Matthew, welcome. Um, we're just about to get kicked off here. There's no waiting room for this session, so um, on already. Uh, as always, if people have questions, you know, leave them in the chat. I feel like we want this to be as sort of engaged um, as possible. So um, we're going to discuss uh, some of what it is like running apparently a 35,000 person online conference, which I was just blown away to hear from David. Um, so we're going to dig into what it means to kind of build community in the event space um, and some other amazing things. David is such a pro, I think, at just online community in general. And um, I feel like it's, uh, it's fun and a little nerve wracking to run an online event with somebody who knows so much. So maybe after the fact, I'll have to get, get some tips on this. Hey, Jackson. Hey, Jesse. Hello, Tessa. Um, we are just about to jump in here. As always, once again, this will be recorded uh, and the, the question box is always available and open um, if you have something that you want to uh, ask David. So um, why, don't we, why don't we kick it off, uh, David, and kind of get started here. And again, I'll kind of moderate um, if people have questions. So, uh, I feel like it's been kind of a crazy year and I, I wanted to start with just like a little bit of a catch up um, for, for what's new your way, because I know so much has changed. Um, you've got some exciting news. Um, so yeah, do you want to maybe start by just kind of sharing a little bit of what's new for you this year um, and what you've been working on, you know, most recently and we'll kind of kick it off there. Sure. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me and good to see everyone here. Uh, thanks. Thanks for taking the time to chat today. Um, yeah, 2020 has been a wild year for more than the standard reasons. Um, you know, uh, in my, in my personal life, I am looking at our, our five week old over there. So we just had our first kid, my wife and I, so, um, that's been a new challenge. <laughs> and, um, so I'm just coming back from leave, uh, a week ago. Um, we hosted our CMX Summit uh, two weeks ago uh, during my leave, which was the first time we've done it virtually. We, it was our 11th conference that we started in 2014, and we had 2,500 people um, attend live for that event. Uh, so that was a wild experience. Um, publishing a book this year. So I signed a book deal this year. Uh, the book's going to be called The Biz of Belonging, all about how businesses can build community. And so that's going to come out in March. Um, that was the hardest thing I've ever worked on. Um, and uh, that's the draft is done now. It's in the editor's hands. So uh, the hard work on that front is done. Um, and then for Bevy, um, you know, so Bevy for context is our software platform. And we are a community software product that powers all of the events for your community. And so we basically designed a program that uh, you, if you have local chapters uh, for your community, so you have someone in London, someone in Spain, someone in, in you know, different cities around the US, um, you could have these local chapter leaders, give them all the tools to run their own events and their own chapters, and then attendees can subscribe to those chapters and keep coming to their events. And you can basically power all of your, your community events uh, through Bevy. Um, and then coronavirus happened. And so uh, all in-person events kind of disappeared overnight. And uh, that kind of threw our business for a loop a little bit uh, because we were very focused on in-person. Um, and so we quickly started adapting and started adding tools so that uh, communities can book their virtual events through you know, Zoom or other tools, but we can still power all the RSVPs and all the operations behind it. And um, we, we hosted a, a, a bunch of events ourselves on like different tools like Zoom and Hopin and, and some of the other tools that were out there and just found that like the tools weren't giving us the things that we needed for our community and for our conferences. And so uh, we got out to build our own virtual event product. And so we have spent the last six months building what I think is a pretty incredible um, virtual event and conference product now. Uh, we just hosted, hosted CMX Summit on it with 2,500 people. 
this past weekend, we just hosted all of Google DevFest's events. Um, it was over 200 events, over 35,000 attendees around the world, all simultaneously. So uh, we were testing our new product with the largest events possible. Um, and uh, it's been a very challenging time for our team. Um, we've, we've all had to work very, very hard, uh, especially our engineering team. But um, we've kind of turned that corner now and we're, we're starting to power a lot of awesome virtual events and conferences and it still plugs into the whole community ecosystem that we built. So um, yeah, it's, it's been a very busy year, uh, lots of exciting things. Um, so lot, lots of silver lining, I guess, in, in what's been an otherwise really difficult year. Yeah, amazing. And we're going to talk about um, Bevy, the software, and we're going to show that off a little bit. We're going to talk about your book some at the end. You know, my, my sense, um, just kind of watching from far, is that community has always been this major through line for you. So everything you've worked on, there's been a very strong community focus. And then um, some of the expression of that originally was in-person events. So you're hosting the summit, um, and you're really building some expertise there. But now you've shifted to like online events. And like you said, hosting 2,500 people, hosting 35,000 people um, using this software. And so I thought it'd be interesting to hear a little bit of just the, you know, before we dig into Bevy as a product, before we dig into the book, um, I thought it'd be interesting to discuss kind of the either philosophy or thesis for how you think about um, community and events tied together. And then maybe we can even talk some about how you think about community and events as it pertains to online, because that's the most recent shift. So yeah, what is just like your general, I mean, you've spent so much time on this. What, what's your high level thesis for people just to put us all in the frame of mind for how you think about it? Yeah. Yeah. So if you zoom out at what an actual community is and what community engagement looks like, it's really just a set of experiences that people share together over time. Um, and so an event is, is one of those experiences, or it's a touch point in an ongoing journey that a community or, or a group of people have together. So you know, if you have an event, then people get together and then there's no way for them to continue to interact or connect, or there's no more touch points, um, then like whatever community feeling, uh, or sense of community that you built up dissipates and and you don't truly get to build an ongoing sustainable community right you might have a sense of community in that moment at that event but then it kind of it kind of fades um you know like one event that comes to mind for me is like south by southwest i've been to south by southwest many times i love the events i meet a lot a lot of my communities show up there but i wouldn't like if someone asked me if i'm part of the south by southwest community not not so much because there's no i don't do anything to interact in that space outside of that event um and so uh you can break down all of the touch points or all of the experience in a community by like synchronous and asynchronous so synchronous is like what we're doing right now it's live it's we're in this space together if i type a message here and i say hey everyone uh where are you coming from and you would all respond to that if you want to Right now, this is live. Uh, we're here sharing this experience together. All right, so David's in LA. I'm in San Francisco. We'll see if anyone else wants to share. Bangkok, great. So uh, Oakland, Arizona, Toronto. So we're seeing all over the world, one of the Berlin, one of the advantages of virtual events is now we can do this live stuff from anywhere in the world. So this is a live synchronous experience. And, and that's what you know, you call any events, whether it's virtual or in person, a small discussion group, a big conference, these are synchronous events that you can organize for your community over time. And then there's asynchronous, which is more of the message boards, forums, slack channels. Um, and that means I might say where are you coming from? And an hour later, you'll log in and maybe you'll respond. So we're not, we don't have to be there at the same time to interact. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, now all, every, pretty much every company was doing some sort of in-person event before. The funny thing is they weren't calling it community. They were calling it field marketing or conferences or conference marketing or something else. And, and something about bringing it digitally makes them think of it more as community for some reason. I, I don't know exactly why that is, but I've always seen it as community, right? It, it's all these touch points that you're bringing people together um, to create connection, to share learning, to create this kind of 
shared sense of belonging. And now it's just, it's just gonna be online for the foreseeable future. Uh, we did a bunch of research into what companies are planning on doing in the future. And on the other side of coronavirus, it looks like most companies are gonna plan to do um, hybrid approaches. So either doing both in-person and virtual events, or even doing events that are simultaneously both virtual and in-person, because I think this experience has made us better at running virtual events. We're all like getting, becoming experts on this stuff pretty quick. And we're seeing the advantages of it, like the accessibility of people coming from around the world, like how much more affordable it is, like how much more content, how much more frequently you can events. Like we, we, did, we did CMX Summit. We had 70 speakers, multiple stages, three days of content. We had a juggling act, like a, a parrot show. We had workshops. We had all this different stuff. And it's awesome. We, we had this big event, but like, why not do a mini conference a month now and we can do one on DevRel, we can do one on community measurement and have it be themed. It's, it's a lot easier kind of do these frequent events um, on a large scale uh, virtually. Um, and that comes at the expense of you know, trade off of just like the, the value that you get from being in person with people, which we just, we can't replicate online. Yeah, I want to zoom in on one area you touched on because I think it's relevant for anybody who's thinking about building a community, which is you said these these sort of events would pop up like a South by Southwest, but the energy after it, you know, stops kind of dissipates. And it seems to me that maybe the, the role or the job or the um, sort of what a community leader does is they keep the energy going, right? You keep the momentum, you keep the cohesion, you continue to, to plan things so that the community can stay tight knit. Um, and so I just want to know if there's anything else you wanted to share about that specifically, maybe as it relates more broadly to community leaders and, you know, what does it look like or what does it mean to sort of keep some type of energy or, or dissipate, you know, mm -hmm. from dissipating essentially, especially for newer totally. builders? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. Um, I kind of like, I think about community a lot in like, it's kind of like music, right? Um, like you think about a song and you, you kind of have like the steady beat that like kind of keeps going and keeps going and, and kind of variable lyrics like that are different. And then like you hit this kind of um, chorus and the chorus, like everyone knows the words to the chorus and it happens every, it happens a few times repetitively. And, and you usually have like the crescendo or like the bass drop, um, like this big momentous kind of like, you know, feel good experience in the song. I kind of think of communities in that way. It's like you want to have a steady beat of, of content and touch points. So that might be your form or your message board where like every day people can come, ask questions, get feedback. Um, and you have to learn like the things that people need every day are going to be different than the things that they need once a month or once a year. So the kinds of conversations and the kinds of uh, interactions that you're facilitating um, on a day-to-day -day basis um, you just need to understand like what are the kinds of questions that people ask and then and you start to like give them the example and, and show them what it's like, you know, to to participate in that community. And then you get like the chorus. It's like, uh, I think of that like kind of like the rituals because it's like everyone knows how it goes. Um, it happens at the same time consistently. And so, you know, in CMX, for example, Every week we have a Monday morning welcome thread. We do a Wednesday promo day. We have a Friday fun day. We do a monthly jobs thread. Um, there are these kinds of regular rituals that people come to expect in the community because they happen at the same time. So you, you can apply the same thing to our events. Um, you know, doing your event uh, the first Tuesday of every month. That means you're taking away questions from your, your members' minds in how to participate. They don't have to ask when's the next event they automatically know at the first Tuesday of every month, it's already be on their calendar, there's gonna be an event. And it can become a habit, right? You're, you're essentially developing this routine that's happening over and over again. It becomes a habit for your community to show up and participate in those regular rituals. And then you have that like crescendo, the bass drop, like the big momentous experience. And so that can be kind of like your conference that happens once a year or twice a year. Um, like the big gathering, like that's where you pull out all the stops and go big production value. Um, so it's kind of like micro opportunities to continue to keep people engaged. And then these kind of big macro ones that happen less often. And a very simple exercise you can do to kind of brainstorm ideas for your community is just right across the top of a piece of paper. 
just write daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annually, and then just write out ideas for what are ways that people can participate or what are experiences that you can host daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annually for your community. And, and you'll just kind of get an idea of what that feels like of having that kind of diversity of different experiences that you can offer to keep your community engaged all throughout the year. Yeah, I think that's a great exercise and I love the music analogy. Um, and I think that continuing to use this word experiences to me is also a really interesting way to keep it focused on if you're gonna create this diversity of experiences weekly, monthly, you make sure that maybe it feels a little different, that it's focused on different things. So there's almost this diversity of how people engage emotionally or with other people in the community. I think that's a really good focus as well. Um, I'd like to uh, dig in a bit to, to Bevy because I think there's a lot of experiences that you have around um, hosting events that I, I think you just have a lot of knowledge there and I'd like to dig in further. So maybe we could um, zoom in a bit more on Bevy specifically if you want to show us a sure. demo, I think that'd be great. Um, and as always for people, if you have any questions for David, um, feel free to leave them in the Q and A. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, so Bevy, like I said, it's, it's a platform to power um, all of your community events, right? So you can think of it as like event powered community. Um, so there's lots of platforms out there that you can use to host your forums and message boards and some of that asynchronous stuff. Um, Bevy is all focused on the synchronous stuff. It's like bringing people together live at a single time. Um, like I said, we, we've we been building this for many years. Um, we're powering uh, the local chapter groups for lots and lots of great companies like Salesforce and Google and Duolingo and um, just like all, all these companies that have these local chapter community programs. Um, most of them are being powered by Bevy these days. And um, and so, and now we're also, we built our own virtual event product, um, uh, which was cool because, so what we saw happen, for example, with CMX was um, we, we have 60 local chapters around the world. And when coronavirus happened, they were like, well, we can't host our events. So they started using Zoom or, you know, whatever virtual event tools they can find. And that's hard to organize as a community team because now we don't know who's attending those events. We can't control the experience. We don't know what's happening. Um, but they, they organically started hosting virtual events, which is pretty cool. Um, now we built our own virtual event platform. So all of our local chapter leaders get full free access to our entire event, virtual event suite. So they don't have to pay for other tools. They don't have to use different tools. They're all on there. And now we as a centralized team have a clear idea of who's hosting events, how many people are, are SVPing for those events, how many people are attending those events, who's attending those events, are they our customers, are they our prospects, are they community members, and we just have much more clear insight into the data. Um, so yeah, I, I could just, I don't wanna to spend too much time demoing, but um, like happy to answer questions and, and just show you real quick. Let me see, I can show you. Luca wants to get in on our meeting today, <laughs> if you hear some background noise. Um, cool. So can you see my screen? Yep. Cool. So so yeah, this is like our own community on uh, CMX Connect on, uh, that's powered by Bevy. So you go to events.cmxhub.com, you see all of our upcoming events. So you can see here, Portugal, Sao Paulo, uh, Austin, Toronto. So these are all over the world. These are being hosted by members of our community. So every every local chapter is run by uh, one or multiple local chapter leaders. We ask them to host an event, um, ideally every month, but at, at least every quarter. Um, and so these are events that are, you know, happening all over the world. So you can go into a specific event, RCP for it, see the speakers. This is our host in Toronto, Pritish. Um, and you can also subscribe to this chapter. So if you wanted to just stay subscribed to Toronto, you go to the Toronto chapter page, you can see all their upcoming events, uh, the host, um, and, and you can join that chapter. So if I live in Toronto, I can join that chapter and now I'm part of that community. Um, and, oops. 
So, so you could see the events uh, by the events coming up. You could see it by region. So you see North America, Central and South America, Europe. These are all of our chapters. You can go into any of the chapters and look just like that Toronto one. If people don't see their city and they want to become a host, they can apply to become a host. And then, um, so that's kind of like the front end experience of the, the community parts of it. Um, and then you, you know, in the dashboard, let me refresh this. In the dashboard, you get all this really interesting data as a result. So what companies were doing before something like Bevy existed is, again, they were just using completely different tools. Their local chapter users were using Meetup or Eventbrite or like all these disparate tools. So they had no idea who was attending those events. They couldn't control the branding um, or the experience. So now like with Bevy, it basically just keeps the branding and everything consistent all throughout. And you get all this really interesting data on, you know, how many events are being hosted every single month. Um, so you can see like at the beginning of this year with coronavirus, it like shot down. And then as people started adapting and moving to virtual, we launched a virtual product. Now we're starting to see much, uh, many more events coming up. Um, you can see it broken down by region. Uh, you can see the number of attendees. This is obviously CMX Summit. So we had a huge boost this month, um, but we're seeing, you know, thousands of people RCP uh, totals, um, specific events, and you can export all this data. So it gives you just much deeper, deeper data into your community. You can also look at it based on chapters. So this is total chapters, uh, how many active chapters we have. So gray here is inactive, these are active. You can see new chapters that are launching. So we see how, how kind of the community's uh, growing, um, chapters per region, um, chapter activity, uh, total cities. Um, so you see some really cool stuff. But one of my favorite things is if you go into chapters, you can also just see who's active and inactive here. And it gives you a good idea of like who you need to touch base with to like reactivate those communities. You can track how that's going. Um, and yeah, and then you also get like member data. So you can see like total uh, people coming to the site, total RSVPs, registrations. So you really understand your community membership. So again, this looks wholly different from most event platforms that just kind of show you who attended one event. It doesn't give you data across all of your events and certainly not across multiple different chapters and instances and leadership. Um, so you just get the, this kind of deep data. And that's like the very brief view of just the analytics, but you can go into chapters, you get your calendar of all your events that are coming up. Um, you can edit your homepage and what shows up there. Um, get a full database of all your members and you can export that. Uh, you can power emails so you can send, it's kind of like an email marketing system right within it. So you can email people based on their location, uh, whether or not they've attended before, how many events they've attended, things like that. Uh, you, we collect surveys at the, uh, automatically um, at the end of every single event. So you get all this, that's also a really valuable thing because you're constantly just getting this survey feedback and data. So one thing we do is we ask for NPS from every attendee at the end of every event. And now we can compare every event to every other event and every chapter to every other chapter based on the ratings that our, that attendees are giving it. So we can see if like a chapter is kind of having low ratings, maybe we need to figure something out. If they're having great ratings, we could talk to them, learn what they're doing and now share those insights with uh, all of our other hosts. Um, you could add sponsors across all of your events um, or specific chapters. Uh, so it's another thing you get control of is where global sponsors show up. Um, lots of cool stuff there. And then finally, I'll just show you real quick. So the virtual event platform. So this is our brand new um, conference platform. Um, it's very customizable. You know, at CMX Summit, this entire top was filled with different navigation items like bookstores and a photo booth and lots of other things we added. But this is kind of the standard that you'll see is just you have your lobby. So this is where everyone arrives. So, you know, we usually have a welcome video here kind of explaining how to use the platform. Welcome to the event. Here's what you can expect. So you would make this video and show it to your community. Um, you can show sponsors here. Uh, you have kind of a quick preview of the agenda on the left so you can see like what's live here and, and join a live session um, so this will take you to a session every session you'll you'll have its own chat here so you can chat with other people in um, in the chat just for that session or you can go to general and that's with everyone in the event q a 
for um, attendees to be able to ask questions and for the moderator to manage it. You can DM anyone else in the event. Um, so there's a whole private messaging, which is actually one of my favorite parts because you actually get to talk to other people at the event. We really built it to not just be like a webinar where you're just listening, but actually fully interactive. Um, so you, then you can go to the agenda, you can have multiple stages, multi days, um, and just see everyone who's gonna be speaking at your event. Um, you go to the main stage, um, you'll see the main stage here. At CMX Summit, we worked with a full AV team. So this is all very highly produced and you can actually, it's built into Bevy so you can stream in external streams. So you can produce your events very highly. Um, networking rooms and booths. So um, these are tables that are facilitated. We also do like um, networking roulette where you get matched up one-on-one -on -one for like five minutes at a time with different members of the event, different attendees sponsor booths. Um, so all the things you would hope for in a regular event, you can now have it all powered in one virtual event. And so this is kind of the virtual conference platform, but you can also go really, really simple. So this is just like, like let's say for this one where there's only 13 of us here and we wanted to keep it intimate, it's a very simple event. This is a very simple event that this is what a lot of our hosts might use. So it's one stage, one screen, you have your attendees, DMs, Q and A, um, and just a basic kind of chat and you can invite other people to obviously join video and make it more of a discussion group versus a speaker, um, whatever format you want, you can kind of use the space in different ways. Amazing. I think that um, it's really interesting to see how you've built this because I, th I think it speaks to some of uh, the actual strategy for um, how to produce or run an online community like this. And I think that, um, like, you know, one, one tip that I, I really pulled from that was um, the NPS score. I thought that was really interesting as well as how do you keep track of how, um, how the community is going, how the, maybe the leader of that community is feeling. And I think um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff within those features that I think are backed by a why um, that's something that you've probably learned or your team's probably learned about, you know, host, hosting a great event. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the cool, the, the thing with Bevy is it came out of a community. So um, Bevy was started out of Startup Grind. I don't know if you all heard of Startup Grind, but it's the largest startup community in the world. There's over 600 chapters um, around the world, all run by local volunteers who run their whole events. Um, they do a global conference in the US and Europe. So massive, massive community. And they were using kind of all these disparate tools before and built Bev built what became Bevy for themselves because they're just like, this doesn't work, this doesn't scale. So they built Bevy for themselves and then started asking around to other companies, like, would you be interested in using this? That's actually when I met Derek, the CEO of Bevy, because he spoke at our conference, that's how I met him. And he was like, do you think community teams would use this? And I had actually been pitching other companies on building exactly what Bevy was because mm -hmm. I saw a lot of companies doing these chapter-based programs and none of the existing tools um, are, are good enough to support this kind of program. So um, yeah, I was like, yes, build it. It sounds great. Um, we started partnering a lot more and that's how Bevy ended up acquiring CMX. And so that's how we became one team. Um, but the entire product was built for a community specifically rather than like, we're just building a product to try to sell it to companies. Um, so you'll, you'll see that ingrained in everything. It's like the, the little details in it. There's very little things. It's like, you wouldn't know unless you've actually run events. Right. But it's like, if you're running an event every month, if you're a local chapter host, there's so many little things that you have to do every time that are very tedious, like recreating your event page, resubmitting speakers and hosts, recreating content, like choosing the format. And so the way it's set up in Bevy is like, you can literally have like event templates and formats. And so with like one button, it'll auto populate all the structure. And then all you have to do is put in like the speaker info. Um, so it just tries to like streamline the, the monotonous work of building community so that you're just focusing on, on like the content and strategy part. Yeah. Amazing. Um, we have a question here from Jesse that I'm going to get to in one moment. Um, and if anyone else has any questions, feel free to throw them in. I, I noticed that we're talking a lot about communities with chapters. And I'm curious mm -hmm. to hear about strategy for, let's say someone's trying to start their new community, or they're trying to scale their community. Why are chapters effective? Uh, or maybe can you just speak mm -hmm. to um, how that scales a community and how it kind of works? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't just apply to chapters and events, it applies to everything in community. Um, 
the only way to scale community is to distribute control. Um, that's the power of community is that uh, it's, it's empowering other people take on roles and leadership in order to grow this thing because um, I can start a community, but as long as it's only limited by my bandwidth, how many events can I host? How many conversations can I engage in or start? Um, how many experiences can I create? Then it, then, then it, it's, it's, that's a bottleneck. But if I can empower 10 other people to host an event or 10 other people to start conversations or 10 other people to become ambassadors of some sort or moderators within the community, right? If I wanna moderate my community, I can only do so much. That's why a lot of communities will set up a, a team of volunteer moderators with, with 10 volunteers in the community. Now, all of a sudden, we can moderate uh, 500,000 people in a community rather than just 50,000. So um, at its core, it's, it's, it's very much about distributing control. The chapter-based program is just like a very clear example of that. Um, it's, it, it also kind of ties into like um, giving, giving your community members uh, some sort of, or your, your most active, your most loyal, your most energized community members, giving them like an official role within the community. So for us, we call them hosts, um, you know, Salesforce calls them trailblazers, Yelp calls them the Yelp elite. It's like, these are your most valuable community members and you give them kind of their own identity and their own role. Um, and so, you know, we, we basically like have this whole process now where people can apply, um, we interview them for the position of being a CMX Connect host. Uh, if they get approved, then we have this entire like onboarding education. They get free access to all of our CMX training programs and content. Um, they get all these perks and benefits. They get access to a community of other hosts so they can support each other. Um, and what we do is we develop a full playbook. So that, that's kind of like a key part of any of these kinds of programs is you develop a playbook that you give to your hosts on how to be successful as a host, how to run your event, how to secure venues, how to choose speakers, here are brand guidelines. Um, just everything we learn continues to be added to that playbook. So it becomes this kind of like growing, ongoing educational resource for anyone who wants to join this program. And now it's much more scalable because we can add 50 new people and we don't have to personally train each one. It, we're kind of institutionalizing that knowledge. Love it. That's such an amazing way to scale. Um, and I just want to, you know, uh, put another point on that naming that role, formalizing that role. Um, like you were saying, the Yelp elite, I think there's something that's, um, you know, it's a small thing to do, but it makes a big difference. Um, I think you have a tweet on that actually as well. Um, and maybe that's mm -hmm. what I'm kind of referencing, but I, I love that concept of just creating that the extra category for the most engaged uh, people to sort of become some new, you know, sort of identity within um, within the community. So I think this is a good segue to totally. Jesse's question. Um, which I was just going to say real quick too. Yeah. I just, I just posted oh, in the ahead. chat. We have, uh, we have a full training specifically, we call it a C2C events program. Um, so it's all on like how to run those chapter based programs. So if you're interested in going deeper on that, we have a full training program on how to set up your playbook and set up that kind of program. Oh, wow. Amazing. I think that's a uh, super, super helpful for people. So I'm glad, glad you linked that up. Um, I think this is a good segue into Jesse's question, uh, which is any words of wisdom for creating a great onboarding experience. Um, and I'm going to assume that's for new members. Um, and, you know, Jesse, if you want to add any extra, you know, to that, feel free to add more details, but let's just start with onboarding new members to a community. Yeah. So um, onboarding is a really, really critical part of every community. Um, and it's your, it's kind of like your first impression, right? So anytime you make a first impression with a person or a group, you want to make the best first impression possible. And so this is kind of their welcome. You also don't want to ask too much of them early on. A uh, mistake a lot of communities make is they say like, welcome to the community. Um, you know, here's a thousand things you're going to do. <laughs> yeah. Like here's yeah. a thousand things or like host an event. It's like, uh, uh, there's actually a concept called the Gitman Curve. Um, I learned about it from Douglas right. Atkin, who was at Airbnb and Meetup. So the idea is like over time, someone's commitment will go up. And so you kind of have this curve. And so the actions that they'll take or the asks you can make of them will go up over time. But you don't want to make a big ask really early on because their commitment's still a lot lower. Right. So Douglas said like when he joined Meetup, they had the mistake of like, welcome to Meetup. Host your first up. And it's like way too big of an ask for the level of commitment that they're at. 
So you want to start really simple, like ask them to introduce themselves or fill out their profile, depending on the platform. Um, I think it's really important to communicate your mission and your values and your rules of the group. Um, you basically want to just like give them, it goes back to that identity. Um, identity is like at the core of everything in community. Um, I talk a lot about that in the book. Um, it, it, like you're creating a social identity. So you're basically saying like, welcome to this space. Uh, here's who we are. Um, here's what we believe. Here's here are things that make us unique in the world. If that jives with you, if, if, if that sounds cool, like to have you participate. Um, now here's like a very simple way to get started. Just like say hello or here are some of our most popular threads you can jump in on. So, you know, pull out the most popular threads that you have and 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 plug that in um uh, to your onboarding experience um you can automate a lot um but especially in your early days when you're building your community being hands-on and personal as possible is ideal so you know if you're starting a community i wouldn't automate any of your onboarding process i would personally email them and say like welcome this is a personal email for me it's not automated i want to welcome every member to this community while we're getting started um, please ask me any questions you have. Here's some of the things I personally recommend that you check out. Um, and then when they join the community, you ask them to introduce themselves. Um, uh, then, uh, then you 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 should personally respond, right? So if they introduce themselves, like uh, what we do in CMX actually is we we tag every member. Still to this day, we have over 10,000 members. We tag every new member who joins. We say, "Welcome to the community. Please introduce yourself." And then we have a welcome committee, a volunteer welcome committee, who's like volunteer to like just show up with a lot of positivity and support when someone joins. Um, all with this design of just making people feel very welcome when they join, and and feel um, included and feel like there's this personal touch. Um, but I'm trying to remember exactly. I, I, I usually recommend like it's three things. It's like when they join, you want them to know um, who we are. So this is who we are. We are a community for developers in Toronto, We're a community for people who believe in positivity in the world of product, right? Uh, whatever it is that makes you unique. Like this is who we are. Um, this is what we believe. So it's like this is our mission or this is what we believe about the world. This is kind of like our belief system. And this is what we do. Uh, so there's like, these are the actions we take. These are the things we do in this community. This is how to participate in this space. So those three things are like what I'd focus on when designing your onboarding experience. Yeah, amazing. And um, Jesse linked up that uh, commitment curve, which is a great thing to check out. Uh, the book um, is The the Culting of Brands, I believe, by Douglas A. Yeah. Um, which I, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll post a link to um, uh, to the talk where I, where I learned about it from him at CMX. Yeah, he's got um, some good talks. Really on, good on Airbnb, right? Um, and some of the stuff that they did to get their kind of community. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, so I, I I'd like to transition um, some to discussing the book a little bit. Obviously, we've talked about events. Um, I've got some really good kind of recap nuggets here that I'll just go through real quickly. I, I love the community is like a song. I think that was really smart. And the exercise for people where you can write out daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly, what are the experiences you're creating in each of those kind of time categories? Um, I think distributing mm -hmm. control was a really great uh, aspect that we kind of covered as well for how to scale. And obviously we just um, covered some of onboarding. So if anybody has any other questions, you know, pertaining to the stuff we've covered, feel free to leave them in the chat here. I just wanted to keep take that kind of quick pause for anyone who wants to speak up, um, throw something in the chat, throw something in the Q and A. Um, give me your hardest questions. Don't give, give David your hardest community question. He's, he's ready and he's got a ton of knowledge, um, you know, on all things community and hosting events. So um, yeah, feel free to leave that in the chat. But, you know, while we uh, kind of wait there, I'd love to start um, looking at the uh, the book. And, I'll and tell you what, here, I'll go ahead. Nice everyone to ask more questions. Yeah. Uh, I'll choose a person at random who asks a question there in the next go. 20 minutes, and I'll give you a, a free CMX training, which are 750 each. So that is, that is awesome. Uh, I, I love that. And I was going to ask, you know, I thought it was fun that hosting this event, I'm like a little self-conscious. How do we make this a great event? David knows how to do that well. I love the question for where people are coming from and stuff. Um, we've already got two questions, so that's 
that's solid. Um, and Great. why don't we kick those I'll, off? I'll, in... I'll, let, I'll, let, I'll, I'll let you choose a random person afterward. You just send them to me and I'll give you a discount code for CMS okay. Academy so you can choose a class. Sounds great. So yes, in, and why don't we let it uh, be the case where anyone can still ask questions and I'll pick from that group from everyone who's asked the questions for the event. So you can still throw it in. There's still time Absolutely. to get the, yes. few, the free Correct. training. Uh, great. So let's start with Alex Brown's uh, question. Any best practices for spurring conversation and engagement in the community if it starts to become a dead space? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, this is where you get in kind of like the art of of community and community engagement and and so i i have like a whole chapter uh like mo most of my book is very structured and like frameworks uh when you get into the weeds of like sparking engagement a lot of the frameworks kind of like you have the the timelines and ways of brainstorming ideas but there's like no way for me to tell you what's going to work in your community but there's no framework i can give you that's like you're going to figure out what's going to engage people it really is a constant experiment um, you just need to like, I mean, listen as closely as possible. Like I think getting on the phone with five of your members, you're going to have 10 pages of ideas of content or discussions that you can start just from those conversations and then just be putting it out there. Um, you need to be showing up every day in the early days. You need to be like the highest energy person in that community and everyone else will fall from there. So if you're showing up like once a day and just checking in and you're not really pushing and facilitating engagement, it's probably not gonna happen on its own. The, the idea of like organic engagement just showing up is a myth. Uh, every community that that's exists today that's big was because someone was showing up multiple times a day, like responding to everyone or getting other members to respond to each other, um, just trying new things, like put out questions, uh, start debates. Um, uh, a really subtle thing I like to recommend is like, instead of asking a question, post a statement and ask people to share whether they agree or disagree. Um, like don't use that negatively to like split people, but like healthy debates are a good thing for community. So it's like, instead of like, um, I don't, a silly example is like, uh, what do you, do you, you know, what social media platform do you prefer to use? I would say like Twitter is a much more valuable social platform than Facebook, agree or disagree. And so that that just like draws people into a conversation because it actually makes them think like, do I agree or disagree rather than like an open ended question uh, isn't as clear. Right. Um, and and people like have opinions and they have pride around their opinions. So um, there's subtle things that like I've learned over time that kind of draw people into conversation a bit more. Um, I think just like being your authentic self and like asking questions that you genuinely have are always a good place to start as well. Cause if you have that question, there's a good chance other people do. Um, being very honest and vulnerable yourself will like get people going because it's so unusual on the internet um, that like, if you're like, hey, I re I'm really struggling with this thing and it's bringing me a lot of pain and stress and depression and like whatever, that's setting an example for your other members that like, oh, this is a safe space where I can ask some of the things that are like harder questions and be more open. So um, yeah, it's really about you showing up, bring a lot of positivity, set the example and, and just keep trying new things and see what resonates with people. If it works, sometimes you could turn it into like a ritual. Like all of the rituals I explained in our community are things I tried once and they went really well. So we just started doing it regularly. Yeah. Amazing. I love that. It's all about kind of you going first, you sparking things. Um, and yeah, you can't, can't skip that. We've got um, a question from Tessa and Matthew that I think are, are similar. So maybe we can kind of answer them together, which is uh, any advice in finding the first users of your community, which is what Tessa asks. And then Matthew asks, what do you recommend when you're starting a community from zero, then you get one or two people. How do you stop them from leaving? Do you maybe have a wait list until you reach critical mass? Um, so yeah, finding the first users and then sort of, you know, nurturing those f first users. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a few questions in there. So finding your first users or finding your first members. Um, again, it's just hands on, you know, like I interviewed Sarah Leary from Door, one of the largest social platforms in the world. You know how she got her first members? She went door to door, knocking on people's doors in one neighborhood and and ask them if they'd be willing to join this social platform um 
you know, Reddit pretended to be members, which I would not recommend doing that. It's called astroturfing. Um, but like, just to show you that even the largest platforms start off like just struggling to get their first members. So, you know, that is where the hustle comes in and the legwork. I would start with people that you know and you have trust with already. Right? Like trust is a critical ingredient um, in all this. So, um, you know, if I were to invite you to a community, um, you would you would immediately start thinking like, who is this person asking me to invite to join this community, and how much do I trust them um, to like know how to curate a good group of people? How much do I trust them to be an expert? So if I were to ask you. You, you know, maybe, maybe you would all join my community now because I've just like built a lot of trust with you over the last hour, or maybe you've seen my content online and you've, I've earned your trust that way. So when I say like, hey, I'd like to invite you to this, I'm curating this great group of um, people who, startups who are building community. Um, I'm keeping it very small to start because I wanna like really get the right people in here and the right mix. So I specifically chose you to join. Um, we're only gonna keep it to 20 people to start and we're gonna just, host ongoing conversations every week, that's a pretty compelling offer, right? <clears throat> You're probably not gonna say no to that. Even if I was a complete stranger, but I was like, this is my passion and I'm, I'm like curating this and you didn't know me at all, you'd probably still join that because you feel like I'm bringing a lot of intention to that space and a lot of energy and it's not just like wildly open. Um, you know, what a lot of communities do is like they launch and there's like, welcome, like everyone join. Um, and they, they don't make it feel like they're putting a lot of attention into who's there. So I think it's, it's actually better to get 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 of the right people in first and get the right foundation of community first. And then, then it becomes much easier to grow it. Whereas like if you start off and you just try to go big right away, you actually lose an opportunity to establish a really strong kind of center of gravity and a strong culture and a strong foundation of community um, that you won't be able to get once there's a hundred or a thousand people in there. Um, the waitlist approach, I'm not actually a huge fan of it from a community perspective. I think it's a great marketing tactic. It could be a great way to scale a community that exists, but it, it, I mean, it's all about creating this like perception of, of value um and and then you end up having this like long list of people um and it, be, it becomes like this social hierarchy thing of who has in and who doesn't um i mean you look at um uh what are they called that just did this uh the audio social network clubhouse, clubhouse mm -hmm. right and it's like i don't know there's like a certain level of like elitism and a certain kind of vibe that that comes as a result of like this long you know, waiting list kind of approach that I, I don't think is going to be good for them in the long run for their community. And I think we've even already seen some um, some toxicity or negativity in that community as a result. So, um, yeah, I would I would start small. Start with who you already know and who you already have trust. Focus on like really quality members that are going to like set the bar very high for the caliber of conversation, and then just show up with all of your energy. Um, to make that that community experience great. Awesome. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, got a question here from Angelina. What What's a good approach to finding high quality speakers and how can you encourage them to participate if you can't compensate them? <laughs> yeah. So speaker outreach. Yeah, I've done this for a long time. <laughs> right, got some is, experience there. It is a journey. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, it's it's hard. It's always hard. Um, we actually, uh, speaker compensation is a topic that I'm actually, I, I'm like doing a lot of research into right now because like the standard in conferences is to not pay for the most part. Um, most big conference organizers I know, and I know a lot of the big conference organizers now, some of the biggest conferences, and they like never pay speakers. Um, CMX, we never paid speakers. Um, we actually just paid one for the first time, um, like for like, see if like paying a big keynote works. Um, and there's just like two very different sides of that argument. Um, there's people who take a lot of issue with that because they feel like, well, speakers are putting a lot of time and energy into preparing, they should be compensated for that work. Um, so a lot of speakers are advocating for like, all speakers should be paid. Um, and 
on the other side and like we were you know bootstrapped tiny like we couldn't pay speakers if we wanted to like more than a hundred bucks or something um so like you know it was it was kind of easy for a long time to say like well we literally can't afford it so um but i you know obviously there's a ton of value for people speaking at events now it becomes this artifact that lives online with their a high quality recording of them speaking um, they get a lot of awareness out of it. They get a lot of brand reputation out of it. They get business out of it. So there's certainly an exchange of value there that isn't monetary. And so, um, uh, but I'll just say I'm doing a lot of research on that myself now, because especially from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint, wanting to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to speak at our event, not just the people who can afford to speak for free is an important element. Um, so that's kind of like the one part of that question, which is like paying or not, um, how to actually get speakers. Like everything else, it's a hustle. Um, and, you know, for our very first event, I'll just say, you know, when we hosted our very first conference, um, I, I tapped into my network as much as I could. I basically found like the best people I possibly could in the world of community that I had a relationship with. The conference didn't even exist yet. It was still like, maybe this would make sense to do. And I asked them, hey, if I do this conference, would you, and they said, yes. And I was like, okay, great. So I put up their names on the site and we started selling tickets before we had a venue, before we had anything. We just like, I got speakers to say like, yes, if you do this, I'll speak. I put them up on the site, started selling tickets just to validate that we could even do an event. Um, one of our keynotes was Robin Dreek, who's a, uh, who was the head of behavioral analysis at the FBI. Um, multi, like best-selling author, just amazing speaker. And I don't know how I came across him. I think I like saw a talk that he gave somewhere else. And I, I sent him an email. And um, the email just was like, hey, my name's David. Um, and I'm, I'm starting this new conference. It's all for building community and community builders. Uh, we have no budget. Uh, we're just like trying to see if this thing would work. I've attached a one pager about our vision and why we exist and what we're trying to do. Um, and I sent that to a number of speakers. Um, Robin responded and he's like, hey, let's jump on a call. And I was like, okay. And like from experience, I'm like, he's going to ask for $50,000. Um, like this is not going to go well. And I get on the phone with him. And the first thing he says is like, David, I read your email. I, I know you're not going to be able to pay me anything and I'd still like to do this. And I was just like, amazing. Oh, fuck. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> um, I, I don't think I even said in it that I could pay him. I it's just like clear from the tone that like, we're not someone who's going to pay him. And he did it. He came out, he spoke, he was incredible. He's now spoken at three of our conferences. Oh, that's great. Um, uh, and has been like an ongoing supporter over the years. Um, and so that was just like, being honest, being direct, like really speaking to why we exist and our passion and our values. Um, and I mean, like I'll send out a hundred invites to like keynote level speakers. All I need is three to say yes. And we have enough for a solid event. Um, now that we've hit our stride, we've done 11 conferences. Now we're getting lots of like great CMOs and CEOs. Um, and um, we, we have a great reputation in the industry. So it's, it's pretty easy for us to get like any community practitioner. The reality is like most practitioners are always down to speak at events. Like if you're running an event for product or developers or whatever, like find the best people who do that work for a company, they're down to speak. Um, the harder ones are to get like the big CEOs or the big authors or like these keynote speakers, which ironically are almost always like not even the highly rated speakers at our event, but they kind of help like just like raise the aura of the event and, and get people to buy tickets so yeah super, super interesting so we have about uh i don't know six seven minutes here and i, I want to get to everyone's questions i also want you to be able to talk cool. about your book a little bit so maybe we can do the 30 second one minute um kind I'll of be more precise the next <laughs> i know it's all it's all great stuff and i think yeah there's so many nuances that i think you know even that note about the aura of a certain speaker versus the practitioner easier to get but um i mean i think that's a really yeah great tidbit right there. Um, but let's, yeah, let's go through the three questions. And if anyone has any other questions you want to add, you know, feel free to do so now, kind of getting down to the wire. So uh, Jackson Reed asks, what advice from community Twitter do you strongly disagree with? So what are people in community Twitter, that subgroup, <laughs> talking about that you actually disagree with? 
Uh, there's so many hot takes these days on Twitter. I'm, like, <laughs> I, I'm used takes. to being the only one with the hot takes. <laughs> now, now everyone's got some. Um, I, I'll just say, like, I don't know that any of the hot takes are wrong. I think they're all the right words. Um, I just, like sometimes I'm concerned that like community has become this buzzy thing to have a hot take about. And the concern is that companies will start using this as a, as like a growth first rather than a people first uh, way of doing business. And the only way it works is if it's people first, it has to drive business growth as well to be sustainable. But, um, I just, like I know people are getting on, on the train because it's hot and because um, it can be used to drive growth. And I just wanna make sure that like we hold the bar of like doing community for the right reasons. Yeah, and understanding why you're implementing some of these uh, ideas, features, rituals. If you understand why, then you can do them correctly. If you do them because you think that you're supposed to, it might not always work. Uh, Jesse's got another question here on growing a community of other community managers. How can you keep raising the bar amongst the members, even if they're competitors? How do you engage that top 10%? Mm. Um, so there's two questions in there, even if they're competitors. Uh, in our industry, they're not competitors. Community managers are not very competitive with each other. Um, there are some communities that have uh, a lot of competition. Rising Tide Society is a good example. Um, they're all local businesses so you might have like two florists in their community in the same local place that like don't want to share secrets with each other um but um natalie frank she actually we have a podcast called masters of community and i interviewed natalie frank on there i just recommend listening to that about she's she's really really smart about it and it's about leading with purpose and values and like so they they feel like they're a part of something that kind of overcomes that that competitive concern um, raising the bar, it, it's a constant challenge. And and frankly, like, I think we've stagnated in our community and we've been around for seven years now. And I just had a call with my head of community. I'm like, yeah, we've, we've stagnated because like we got comfortable with things that worked two years ago that we were still riding the wave from. And there's some new competitors in the space that are like doing a great job with community right now that I'm like, wow, they're, they're beating us in terms of like being nimble and creative. So the same way like a startup needs to continue to innovate and continue to experiment and not get, not stagnate, not like get too comfortable. It's the same for community. Just like keep trying new things, keep cutting things that are no longer working or, or aren't working. Um, if a piece of content used to work and now it's not getting engagement, great, cut it and start trying new things. Um, and I have a rule for my community team as well that we're, we recently instituted that they have to talk to at least two community members every month. And so just like continuously stay close to the ground and continue to talk to your members because as it gets big, like CMX has, it becomes easy to just be like, oh, we kind of know what's going on because like we have 10,000 people in this space and 5,000 in this space, like we can watch, but like talking to people one-on-one -on -one is literally the only way you're really going to understand. Amazing. All right, one more question here. And then, uh, yeah, I'd love to, for you to just point people to where they can find your book, et cetera, and we'll, and we'll wrap there. Um, awesome. So Alice asks, what's your take on paid versus free events, especially for online? Yeah, great question. Um, so, uh, I mean, we've always charged for CMX Summit. Um, CMX Summit was always a, you know, meant to be a sustainable business. Um, we're acquired now, so there's like other value that we're driving, but we still charge for tickets because we want it to be perceived as a premium event. That said, we just did CMX Summit Virtual. We made it free um, and we uh, had like an all access pass that people could buy for a hundred bucks. So it's still cheap. Um, it, it, go, it comes back to your goals. Um, are you optimizing for more people? Um, with like less curation and less of like a bar of quality or do you want um, less people but the right group you know we we still charge hundreds and hundreds of dollars for uh, cmx summit in person and we had a thousand people come to that event so you can charge and obviously still south by southwest charges and obviously they have about tens of thousands of people there so um uh it, it's a lot of pricing e either you're trying to make money because you need to make money or you charge because um you know it's about creating again that like aura of quality and professionalism. Um, I think virtual, it's just hard now because there's so much for free 
Um, so if you do charge, you need to go that extra mile in production and quality and curation. And we even went that extra mile and still did it for free. So um, it's, it's harder to charge for events today. I think like you need to really communicate the value um, if you're going to charge for events because it's just like people are, people are also like already exhausted a little bit by virtual events. So if anything, it's, it's getting harder to get them in the door, not easier. Great thing to consider. Uh, thank you so much for the time, David. Uh, thanks everybody for hanging out, for asking your questions. One of you will be getting uh, this this playbook uh, for free, or actually the Academy for free. Um, so looking forward to mailing that out. I'll connect with you afterward. Um, yeah, if you just wanna share where people can find the book, where people can find you, we can kind of just wrap with that. Um, and uh, oh. yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the book, not sure. If it's how, how far out it's going to be. Um, but uh, yeah, if you just want to share whatever um, you'd like. Yeah, well, it'll, it'll be out in March uh, is, our, is our current plan. Um, I just shared a, a link to a tweet. Um, so it's my pinned tweet. So you just find me David Spinks at Twitter. Perfect. As David knows, I'm, I, I tweet too much. So <laughs> um, follow me there. And um, if you go to that tweet uh, and it's a thread, there's a link to the pre-order form. Uh, that I'm just keeping for now if you want to be on the pre-order list uh, to be notified about that when the book becomes available for pre-order and I can let you know there. But yeah, thanks for the support. Amazing. Yeah. So definitely encourage people signing up for that pre-order. I'm about to go do that right now. One of you will get a follow-up on this Academy and there's some good links in this chat. If you want to click them now before this all closes, the uh, the event program playbook, which is definitely a link that I'm popping open to check that out. Cause that looks amazing. Thank you so much again for the time and all of the wisdom. I feel like this was a jam packed, uh, event of just tons of good things to take away. So I really appreciate it. Awesome. Yep. So glad to hear it. Um, if anyone has any questions as well, so at me or you could DM me on Twitter, my DMS are open. Happy to answer any additional questions that come up as you're working on your community strategies and, and say hello. I didn't actually get to like see what all of you are working on and the communities you're building. So I'm sure it's all incredible stuff. So drop me a DM on Twitter and let me know what you're working on. Amazing. All right, everyone have a great rest of your day and uh, we'll see you in the next one. All right, thanks everyone.